Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Coin Geek Weekly Live Stream. I'm your host, checking my microphone live on here, uh, <laughs> Kurt Walker Jr. So we are here uh, one hour later than typical to uh, accommodate one of our guests who uh, I can relate dearly. Uh, had to do some family duty stuff that conflicted with him being here at the normal hour, and so uh, we we made it work to have him on. Uh, and I can relate because I have two children of my own and a third on the way so i got a wife that needs a little extra help <laughs> so uh we're looking forward to having uh marcin uh zarkovsky from uh bsv associate we're, we're gonna have to clarify uh there's been a few iterations of what the what the group is called i i in my head it's bitcoin association but i know it's different than that now so we'll, we'll clarify that first thing uh and then connor murray who's uh you know one of the guys who uh, has been on this crazy ride, uh, you know, with with me and a, and a few of the OG uh, big blocker types for for many years now. So we'll be talking specifically about the network access rules stuff. Uh, NAR, the the gnarliest protocol uh, in the in the last uh, at least ten days. So <laughs> we'll be uh, we'll be covering some of that. So please get your questions, uh, comments, criticisms, uh, all of that ready. Uh, I, I want to make sure that the show is particularly valuable. So if you have something that's really bugging you about it or something that you might feel better if this one thing was clarified, please make sure you put those in the box here uh, and we'll be asking those questions. So if you're watching, please like, subscribe, hit the alert bell, all of that stuff. It really, really helps us out with the algorithm. Uh, not just that you do it, but if you haven't done it, uh, just adding that subscription, uh, that's that's one of the main things that tells the al algorithm that our show is worth watching. So uh, it's not just some trivial thing. It actually legitimately helps the channel, helps us grow and uh, spread the word about Bitcoin and all the cool stuff that we're doing here with uh, BSV blockchain. So a uh, little update. Today is my birthday. And so I was asked kindly if I could still do my show at the regular hour. And I said, yeah, sure. And then I was asked, can you do it a little bit later? And I was like, you know what? Why not? So uh, <laughs> for everybody who's been saying, uh, Kurt, why don't you take time off for your birthday? Well, two things. A, I love my work. And B, uh, it's just, it's, that's it. I, I love my work. My family is literally in the other room waiting for me to be done so we can hang out. And uh, so as soon as we are done, we're going to do exactly that. And please leave me alone after 4 p.m. Eastern time today. <laughs> so, uh, but no, if you're watching, I really appreciate it. Uh, this to me, like you guys are, I guess not as much my family as my real family, but I really like you guys out there and I appreciate you watching. So, uh, Mr. Ward, we've got Brandon Ward at the keyboard today doing the production thing. So the uh, show is produced entirely from South Florida today. Uh, you know, apologies to Mr. Moon. And <laughs> we, we will be uh, running an ad and then we'll be back in a couple minutes here with uh, both Connor and Marson from BSVA is what I think we're calling it. So, uh, Mr. Ward, please play the ad and we'll be right back. BSV is more than another chaotic commodity craze. BSV blockchain can do more than just be a crypto investment. It can help you get more out of your games, share more of your art. BSV makes more things possible. Hey, gentlemen. Hi, Kurt. <laughs> hey, I appreciate, right, well, uh, you know, moving the show, and I hope I will not have your wife chasing me. No, we'll no, no. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> For ruining your birthday. For sure. No, it's to totally fine. Um, all right. Let, I couldn't let's think start. of a better birthday present than us two, though. But. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, right. Like, dear, no, I'm going to hang out on the internet with my Bitcoin friends. <laughs> it's going to go well. Um, all right. Let's. I feel like the show could go long if we let it go long because there's a lot to talk about. So let's let's get right to it. I want to um, also clarify that the network, the the NAR stuff actually applies a lot more to me than it does to almost anybody else in the ecosystem because we're one of the only completely independent, uh, honest node mining pools in the BSV ecosystem. So um, we we have had to you know digest this pretty quickly and. You know, try to get familiar with it, discuss it amongst our our board, and and that kind of thing. And um, you know, for me, my my knee jerk reaction since any of this was discussed, you know, a year and a half ago or whenever it first came up, as kind of an old school Bitcoiner, I want to resist it largely because I'm a contrarian, but um, just just conceptually, it's a little bit like 
you know, this, this feels like I'm, I'm getting a, not a slap on the wrist. Cause I don't feel like I'm being punished, but I, I feel like it's a here, Kurt, here's a leash for you. When I feel like I have done nothing to deserve uh, a leash. And so um, if, if one of you guys wants to sort of take the lead and kind of explain a little bit, the background, if you could just kind of explain like, where is this coming from fundamentally and you know how many decisions were were put into the, the release that was made last week because i know i know you guys had to have spent a lot of time probably debating every comma and every little thing and okay what what does it mean if we if we say we here versus if we say they or us or we you know that that kind of thing so if if you could just walk me through the process what was the thought process how much work went into this on your end and then we will ask some more specific questions please there's a lot of questions in there that I, I can answer some of them and marching can probably answer some of them better. Yeah. Um, uh, let me, let me start. <clears throat> okay. So where did, where did this come from? Right. Um, well, okay. So, so let's take a step back. Right. Uh, as you mentioned, you are a miner on the network. Uh, there's a, there's a few miners right now. In fact, um, uh, I, I believe right now the majority miner is mining Dutch as of today. That will probably change tomorrow and next week and, and whatever else, right? Um, <clears throat> there is a clear definition of rules of what it means to be a miner in Bitcoin, right? Uh, so there's the Bitcoin white paper that details what a node's responsibilities are. It, it, uh, there, there are st six steps in there, and it, but it basically boils down to um, you collect transactions into a block, you build a block, and you extend the blockchain, right? Um, the... 95% of what is in this, uh, these network access rules is to write that down into a clear terms and conditions, essentially, right? Uh, meaning uh, a node has very specific responsibilities. Per the white paper, th there is honest behavior and there is dishonest behavior. Um, so for instance, uh, one very clear uh, element of dishonest behavior outlined in the white paper is that you do not include double spends in the blockchain, right? Uh, so if you build a block that contains a double spend, that is dishonest and nodes should reject that block and not build on top of it. Um, for the most part, there are two mechanisms by which dishonest behavior is not built on in Bitcoin. There's the technical means by which the node software itself automatically rejects certain invalid behaviors. So, um, for instance, you run the SV node software. If I were to produce a block that contains a double spend, your node software would not build on top of it because it says this is an invalid block per per these esoteric rules that are out there somewhere, right? Yeah, uh, it doesn't build if, on top if of If you it. can read the code, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then there's the more fundamental piece of which you can't write everything into software, but there are conditions by which something could be dishonest and, and added to the blockchain um, and, and you wouldn't want to build on top of that. So a, a very, you would remember this two and a half years ago, there's nothing in the software right now where if, if I were to produce 150 blocks in secret and publish them all at one time and reorg the chain 100 plus blocks deep, the node software does not have a mechanism by which it would say, you know, it's going to analyze what, what it's seeing and, and perform some check against the rules of the network and determine this yeah. is invalid or this is valid. It's going to just say, this is the longest chain tip. There must be something going on that I, I you know, I'm just going to switch to the longest chain tip and mine on top yeah. of it. And therefore, um, you know, revolts, right. But we could very clearly have a discussion as to why that's dishonest behavior. Right. Um, and I'm going to end this monologue in one second and, and, uh, let March and join in. But yeah, the, the point being, uh, there are technical means by which we identify dishonest behavior, and then there's just fundamental philosophical means by which we identify dishonest behavior. Yeah. Instead of leaving it up to uh, some esoteric argument of this is or this isn't dishonest behavior, this is very clear contractual terms by which um, honest and dishonest behavior are defined. And uh, it does not affect anyone like you or or any other miner that follows the rules of the network. Uh, the entire purpose of this is is not to punish or put you on a leash. It's basically just to say, um, great, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do and, and 
you're entitled to the block reward if you continue to do uh, what you're sure. supposed to do. Cool. Yeah, <clears throat> look, if I asked you, Kurt, two weeks ago, so before um, the NAR uh, were released, if you knew what is an honest behavior on, on Bitcoin, I guess you would be able to tell me, you'd probably point out to, to, to Bitcoin white paper. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess you would also be able to tell me that as Connor has mentioned, including double spends into blocks mm -hmm. is clearly a dishonest behavior. So there was sort of an agreement, but maybe not a, an, an illegal, like not in, a, like in writing, but there was an agreement of nodes of members of the network that mm -hmm. agree that, look, we are going to respect how the protocol works, how the node software works, hence how the network operates. What we did with that's maybe that's a good starting point. We decided to put that in writing. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had to do a first step before, which is document what the protocol is, because we've been always saying, yeah, well, this is the Bitcoin protocol. Bitcoin protocol is set in stone. But if somebody asks you like, okay, but what, what really is Bitcoin protocol? <laughs> From where do you derive uh, all the, yeah. all, all the, all the fundamentals? Yeah. There was no one place to which we yeah. could point to. So you, you we had to document some tax and a bunch of red yarn to, <laughs> to exactly. answer that question. So, <laughs> so yes, we, we were documenting the Bitcoin protocol and in parallel, and to answer your mm -hmm. question, when was the decision made? To, to start working on the codified rules for the network. I think it was a year and a half ago, more, more or less. It's been a very lengthy process where we involved uh, very experienced and knowledgeable lawyers, specialists in the field. And I guess we'll have also an opportunity to, to mention uh, where did they come from and what sort of expertise they brought into the table. Um, and it took a while to really polish the rules all angles to the form uh, that, that they can be seen today. Yeah. And when you were opening, you mentioned that, well, uh, the rules especially apply to you as a, as you know, uh, as Gorilla Pool. Yeah. But I, I could say provocatively and a little bit preemptively, it especially applies to Tal. Hmm. Because there have been a lot of arguments around there, um, mostly coming from, from our foes who said, well, especially after you know tal went private it's no no secret that tal is fully owned by calvin Air. Right. and uh, there are many people saying bsb is a it's calvin's chain yeah. so uh why would you even use and do anything with bsv if calvin can just do whatever he can uh, he, he wants if if he has 90 percent of a hash on the network by releasing these rules i mean all that is just you know it's a it's a legal it's, it's a kind of construct it's not true right but uh yeah, uh, he would never. As far as I know, he would never do anything against uh, the network I mean, because and, he was and, respecting and, the rules. Sure. And well, right and, now and there is an fair, argument with today, Bison. <laughs> today it's you know a bunch of nameless, faceless uh, Dutchmen that are in control of the network from a hash power standpoint. So exactly, <laughs> even that. So yeah. the, 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 these argument uh, because network access rules is is an argument is a multilateral argument between the nodes and the association is yep. binding you the same way it's binding upon tau the mm -hmm. same way it's binding upon mining dutch and the same way it's going to be binding upon any other miner that is going to join the network and finally yep. it's also binding and limiting what the association can do yeah so so that leads to my my first question and this is the response i would give to anybody saying ah oh, it's just calvin's chain and i always say my response is is well what what indication do we have that Calvin wants to abuse the chain? Uh, you know, like he, he has the least incentive to do such a thing. But at the same time, you know, to talk about BSVA and some of these other things, like, you know, what what are the what like what is the segregation of authority across some of these entities? Because it's also not a secret that Calvin is a major investor, if not the largest investor in Enchain, and that BSVA is, you know some kind of tangential entity to uh, Calvin's empire as well. How clearly defined are those things? And, you know, I mean, that's that's what all the critics are going to say is that, yeah, but isn't this all just shell company, shell company, shell company, and there's a puppet master? 
I think quite the opposite. With the release of the of the rules, this entity that the association is, which is mm -hmm. based in Switzerland, is not based in Antigua, Cayman Island, another you know, tax yeah. haven. It's based in Switzerland. It is audited. Yeah. We under undergo every year an audit. Um, we fall under all the rules and regulations in Switzerland. And we, as an association, as a nonprofit, we don't have an owner. What we have are members, right? So there are members that they can join the association and they have uh, voting power and they can obviously decide uh, where does the association go. And I understand some of the arguments, uh, especially to those that don't really analyze what the association does, what's its legal setting, sure. et cetera. But there was this impression that the association is just yet another entity in the group holdings of, of, of Calvin Air, right? Like, as you mentioned, Enchain and other, other entities that he has invested in. With the release of these rules, uh, we are kind of providing also tr assurances to everybody that wants to you know, either build upon DSV, and now I'm talking about developers and, and, and builders, but also if you're a miner, if you want to participate in the network and and and, uh, and mine, we give you kind of a clarity. If we misuse our powers to any extent, if we break the rules, we can be held liable. Yeah. And well, I believe that Switzerland, at least in the common perception, is perceived as one of those jurisdictions which are rather safer and which are more, which are respecting rule of law, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Sure. So uh, can, can I add to, so yeah. taking one step back, the more fundamental part of your question is like, why does the association exist, right? Um, uh, Kurt, you know, you would appreciate the fact that uh, the association, its its main purpose is basically to protect the protocol, right? This is one of its main reasons for existence is the, yeah. the protocol exists. We want to keep it set in stone. Um, and, and so how do you have a framework by which we can ensure that there's no development group that will come in and uh, decide to, you know, inflate the coin supply or, or you know, whatever other protocol uh, thing you want to change, right? So, so one mandate of the association is to ensure the protocol remains set in stone. Um, mm -hmm. This, these network access rules help ensure that that happens, right? Sure. Um, but it, it also means um, for, for Bitcoin, Bitcoin's existence, you do need the ability to uh, add rules. And, and, and by rules, I don't just mean like... Uh, Orphan every block that comes from Gorilla Pool. That's not the rule that I'm talking about, right? Right. Um, but I am talking about. First, uh, <laughs> um, this guy. <laughs> th these are like the fundamental questions that we had to sit down and figure out. Okay, how does the association gonna handle this yeah. stuff? You know, or else, what about the difficulty, Justin? So, so my, I'm gonna ask you a question, Kurt, and then we can reason through it together and help understand maybe our perspective, sure. right? Um, why is the difficulty adjustment the way it is right now, and should we? Revert it back to the original difficulty adjustment today. Oh, I, I can blame the French. <laughs> so it was uh, it was Amore Sochet's idea initially, and we've just sort of carried it forward because it wasn't something that was critical. Now, obviously, there's an argument to be made that if we had the standard difficulty adjustment like BTC, then anybody could come in with a lot of hash power and cause chaos. So the, the adjusting, uh, or whatever they call it, the adaptable uh, difficulty adjustment um allegedly is for safety but uh i would argue that the the huge negative consequence of it is that it makes it very easy to come kind of raid bsv from an arbitrage standpoint so every time we could have two weeks where it's more profitable to mine bsv it's six hours instead and then you know people sure. leave again so um but, yeah is it part of the protocol <clears throat> No, I would argue it's not actually. Yeah. So it's it's a it's an implementation decision. Right, right. Uh, yeah. so, so I'm asking questions, not that there's a right answer. Yeah. I, I would maybe sure. There but, is. but that would be my argument. <laughs> and the point being, you know, the, this is uh, the association's responsibility to figure this out, right? Essentially, yeah. um, in the same way, Omri Sachet decided to change the difficulty adjustment, mm -hmm. um, 
And I would argue under the terms of the rules that exist in the white paper, which are that any needed rules can be added yeah. and enforced by the miners. That's an example of, look, there's um, all this SHA-256 hash rate, or, you know, hash power that's that's out in the globe. Not all of it wants to protect the BSV network, therefore, or, or at the time the BCH network, we're gonna add in this new rule that the difficulty isn't gonna adjust every 2016 box, it's gonna adjust dynamically so as to protect the network from, let's say some malicious activity like you just described, right? Um, so, so the point being, uh, now BSV is however many years old, um, we will need to make a decision at some point to restore the difficulty back to, to its original. There needs to be some entity that decides that. Um, the association is the entity that's been granted the stewardship role to do that. Um, but we had to sit down and understand under what framework can we change the difficulty adjustment, right? Um, and, and the network access rules are, are, are an example of, we've codified the clear terms by which we can update, quote, any needed rules in the network. Mm -hmm. But it also shackles the association in some ways where, you know, we can't just modify any rule we want. We can't inflate the coin supply. We can't, um, you know, change right. the way transactions are constructed, for instance, right? Um, so, so there's a needed um, clarity here that, that I think you can appreciate, I can appreciate, I could appreciate a year and a half ago, two years ago, yeah. when I asked these questions internally of like, uh, you know, who's responsible for the protocol here sure. at the association, right? Um, and things like that. And, and there's, so, a needed, there's a need for transparency and clarity. So let me, let me insert an anecdote real quick. Um, when, when the empty block, I, I don't think it was an attack actually, because I don't think they were malicious. I, th I think they were, you know, a zombie pursuing uh, profits essentially. Um, but the the way that it was behaving, and I, I made this argument to a lot of people at the time. Now, as the smallest mining pool, I didn't want to have to essentially fork the chain and then hope Tal and you know, I think it was even SBI and a couple other people to come join. Like, hey, come mine Gorilla Chain. We're the honest chain here because of whatever. But the problem was is there was no communication vector. Like, we did not have a way to contact that miner. I didn't have a way to contact, I mean, other than having the phone numbers of, you know, some people at Tal and, and whatever to say, hey, guys, I I think, and, and I was advocating for this. So me personally, I put my neck on the line to advocate and say, hey, I think that we need to collectively choose a block and no longer build on their blocks from this one forward because I don't think they're an attacker, but there is an obvious network degradation and it is our job to maintain the, the network uh, in a way that is is valuable and then literally everybody was like well i don't know if we ha I, I don't know if we can do N nobody knew whose job it was to to make that decision so everybody's calling the ceo of whatever organization they're at and i'm sitting there saying no guys i think it's our call and i think at the time it it was frankly now what i think that illustrated was the need to have some kind of a process by which there is a collective decision you know war powers essentially <laughs> so um you know as much as i don't like that kind of terminology but it did illustrate that weakness where what if the only honest node is the smallest node on the network and through apathy people just say eh, we're just we're just gonna do whatever makes us the most money regardless of standards so i'm, I'm curious how much was that scenario considered uh, you know, what, what if the network is 95% malicious and 5% are the good guys? Like, how does that play out with exchanges and all the other tangential stuff that's related there? I think uh, I'm, well, I'm not shying away from the question and from answering this question. I think before we, we answer this, it would be good to, for the course of our discussion, establish what does it mean that the protocol is set in stone? Because that it's clearly sure. saying where what we cannot change, what we cannot do, what is the limitation also of our powers. And then we can tell you why it makes sense and why we think the association should make sort of a decision when it comes to empty block miner. Um, Connor, I think you, 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 would, you would explain it better from the tech terms and then I can, I can rely on more, uh, more layman terms. What does it mean that, what, what is it that is really set in stone? What is the, the core fundamental? Sure. Um... 
Look, uh, when we had to ask ourselves, what is the protocol? It was, it was our own little struggle the same way, Kurt. I, I, you might give a different answer. Um, <laughs> we had to come to an answer, obviously. Yeah. Um, and it became clear to me, I would have thought the difficult adjustment maybe would be under that category, but then I had to think it through and realize, well, no, it, it, it's a rule. It's a rule that's added on top of the protocol. The protocol being set in stone, why would you want something set in stone for stability? And what is the guiding North Star of stability in Bitcoin? It is that a transaction that's made today will always be valid in the future if it's valid today. And what I mean by that is um, one of the main one of the main uh, downsides to the instability caused by development groups in the past is you could, if you were a, a, let's say you're a corporation, you know, a large corporation that wants to develop an application on top of Bitcoin. You could put a ton of R&D into building an application that two years later, the way you use the blockchain is now broken, right? Yeah. Um, and and the, the fundamental way by which that would happen is that uh, you're creating transactions today that all of a sudden don't work two years from now, right? right. Uh, you can't have, for instance, like a trust, like an offline trust um, that let's say I signed a transaction, keep it offline, and 100 years later, you, you broadcast it to the network to execute some kind of... Um, you know, uh, transfer of, of, of assets, right? Well, that can't work if the protocol is, is not stable, meaning a transaction today that's valid, isn't valid in a hundred years. Right. Um, so, so, and so a good yep. yeah. And a good analogy for in layman terms is like, everybody knows Lego bricks, right? Yeah. You, you probably had Lego bricks when you were, when you were kids still do. And, <laughs> The beauty, exactly, and the beauty yeah. of them is if you if you go on you know uh, on the attic and you unpack one of those boxes with your toys, you take the Lego bricks from 20, 30 years ago, and you uh, take Lego bricks that you, you bought for your kids, they match, yeah. right? Sure. You can still use them. Each, I mean, you can use them with each other, right? So it's the yeah. same little bit with with the protocols and the stone. Lego is not changing the fundamental design because they will just ruin all yeah. the all the other previous sets that they released before and now coming back to your question so this is something that is limiting like we'll never ever touch this functionality right yeah um coming back to a to, to block miner yeah i remember the situation uh, pretty vividly <laughs> and we were asking ourselves is this miner just setting the uh, the fee particularly high and well miners should be should should miners be free actually to set uh their my own mining policy uh, fee policies yeah um and we also came to the conclusion that what that miner indeed was doing was causing a disruption to the network and whether willingly or unwillingly whether that miner was purely economically motivated and because of still insufficient number of transaction mm -hmm. in the network that lead to still insufficient amount of transaction fees that they can you know can be aggregated can be earned for winning a block so it makes sense to you know for all the hassle it was easier for him just to ignore it and just go for the block subsidy yep but the disruption was significant the disruption was first to to to, to businesses that use bsv uh you know that miner was mining empty blocks sometimes they were it was leaving and then it was harder for other miners to 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 to, to deal with the mempool that was aggregated uh, really big that was one thing. The another description was that for a, a user of any BSD based application, what the user sees like, okay, my transaction is not going through. So what a user, so a kind of a client of those that are building and relying on BSD blockchain, he will blame the application, he will blame the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and this is another sort of kind of disruption because it, it um, reduces the trust to the network as an infrastructure. And let's also be, be, be blunt here. We are, we are very early, and I'm speaking about the whole blockchain ecosystem, not only about BSV, but in general, when it comes yeah. to adoption, and when it comes to really seeing real life use cases that, that get, get adopted by you know, different industries. It's super early. We are talking about you know, NFTs and, and, and all this stuff. Right. If we want to, if we look at this as the, as the plumbing, as the, as the embedded protocol, as the infrastructure for data and for microtransactions and all these things, um, this network needs to be kind of stable from all angles. Mm -hmm. And the decision was, 
yes, th th there has to be something done to that empty block miner. How do we make decision? What's the ground? So that yeah. actually a little bit accelerated our works on the network access rules. The, it, it, it showed us that we must somehow provide a possibility for the association mm -hmm. uh, to, to protect the network, to protect other honest miners. But if you read the, read, read the rules carefully, um, there is nothing saying you cannot mine empty blocks, like, like really super bluntly, because this happens. I mean, every miner right. from time to time statistically can mine an empty block. It's a kind of, you know, it's a glitch. And uh, should we should we then orphan this block? Should we punish the miner that mined one empty block? Um, it is very subjective. Um, yeah. Hence, what the association, the association under the rules has a possibility to react. Uh, we internally will be discussing this. Our first goal will be to reach out to that miner and say, hey, you know, you, you, you've been mining Empty block miners is is anything happening? Is is didn't you maybe you know change your settings in the node software or uh, you have problems with uh, how you connect to other peers? Uh, anything, right? We, let's just let's just clarify that. If there is a consecutive you know mining of empty blocks that really disrupt the network, we will request all the other nodes to take action. But mm -hmm. if we do it in an unjustified manner and that miner whose blocks were orphaned because they were empty because we took action that miner has a legal recourse against us under sure. these rules contractually and we might be held liable for all the damages that we might have caused to that miner if we didn't act if we act like unre unreasonably sure so this is also our limitation well and, and uh, it... this was unfortunately the best we could come up with Given the nascent state of the network and what you want to to achieve with with, with it, right? Well, it's it's funny because that was actually what I came up against when when I started reaching out and saying, "Hey guys, we, you know, again, I I don't think the empty block miner was malicious at all. I think it was just opportunity and profit and whatever." But when users started to complain, I felt that it was incumbent upon us as as the you know the honest nodes of the network to do such a thing but that was the main uh fallback was well yeah but what if what if he comes after us and sues us for essentially stealing his block rewards and that kind of thing like basically nobody wanted to be liable uh, <laughs> uh and and well here for instance like looking purely from your perspective as one of the miners on the network if the association for the other system sends you a directive that you need to, as one of the miners you should yeah. for instance orphan the block of the mentee block miner yeah. The association provides you, uh, like your liability is limited under network access rules. Sure. Because you were acting under this contract because that you agreed to, and the association sent you an alert, and you were just performing whatever was requested under the alert. Yeah. Uh, that should give you, as, a, as an honest miner, more assurances that you shouldn't be sure. afraid of, 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 of taking any action. So, just can, can, another okay, anecdote. One. Can I add yeah, one no, thing no. on top of this? It sure. Maybe to underpin the discussion, right? Um, there, there's two fundamental questions about it, too. Number one, what is the block reward for? The block reward is for performing the steps laid out in the white paper, right? So there's very clear um, a, a, a node in the network that is just not mining transactions that are out there in, into the blockchain is very clearly not fulfilling their end of what we would have called the unilateral contract, right? This This idea that the coins sure, are offered they're on these they're terms. They're providing a service. They're hammering right. it. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, it's not really a. <laughs> as we just said, there's a there's a difference in you know, maybe having different fee policies and whatever else. That, that's one thing, but uh, willfully joining the network and not performing the main functions of what you're supposed to be doing and obtaining the block reward under those those pretenses is is an issue, right? But yep. the, the other part of it is. The reason we're even having this discussion is unfortunately that uh, it's very early in, this, in in two ways. Number one, uh, the, the BSV network has one one hundredth of the global SHA-256 hash rate right now, about that number, um, which means at any time, as Kurt well knows, there's a lot of people that don't like us. Someone could point a BTC mining pool at us and, and basically cause havoc on the network, right? So the need to have some kind of recourse 
is for for that. Whereas when Satoshi created Bitcoin, the assumption was the global computing power would grow over time and that growth over time would all be yep. pointed at one global chain, thus providing more security for the network. Unfortunately, yep. we aren't in that scenario right now. Um, so, so that's kind of a, okay, shit, we're not in that scenario, let, let's figure out. So how do we counteract this? Uh, yep. The other reason, the other way we would counteract this instead of just coming out with network access rules rails is to scale the network as large as possible, which is the other function the association is, is performing right now because yep. You scale to millions of transactions per second. Guess what? There's no way to do that without basically ignoring an empty block miner because you're not going to accept traffic from someone that hasn't been sharing transactions with you to help produce large blocks and things like that, right? So that would be yeah. a in a future a technical means by which you would ignore traffic from someone like an empty block. Well, miner, that's right? that's real economic security. I think that's that's right. kind of the point. Yeah. So. It's funny, I, I always, and, and I've said this a bunch of times, uh, but in, increasingly that you know, I'm, I'm a, a social libertarian, I'm a legal libertarian, I'm very, um, I don't trust governance and people that want to get into governance positions as a rule. I, it, it strikes me uh, typically as the person that, that thinks that they would be in a, in a good position to have authority, I'm all, <laughs> I always suspect like, nah, you probably would be the worst person to put in authority because you you think you'd be good at it. But I've I've come to realize over time that if you look at history, that people end up being governed about as much as they deserve to be. And so my my presumptions about Bitcoin over time, and this is now God, I'm 12 years into my Bitcoin journey here, where I looked at mining and said, oh, that's perfect. That's perfect governance. It is that economic governance system and the incentives will lead people to want to cooperate better and create value and all, all these things. Like it's going to be a perfect experiment in capitalism. We're, we're going to prove that we deserve to self-govern. And I've, I've admitted a couple of times recently, a couple of interviews, I think I've even tweeted it, that I think that Bitcoin has made people objectively worse over the last 15 years than it has better. Like more people who have interacted with Bitcoin have been worse for it. Like it has made them unpleasant, uncooperative. Uh, they've desired more so to attack Bitcoin than to embrace it or grow it or, or, or let it be. And so, you know, when I, when I look at, again, the empty block miner situation, the fact that everybody was a little bit, I don't know, I don't know what to do. Like that tells me that, okay, we didn't have anybody who deserved their authority essentially at, the, at that moment. It's, it's kind of like being a general in a country that's about to be invaded and, you know, and everybody just bickers instead of defending the border essentially. And so I look at that and say, well, yeah, if nobody will act, if the, if the alleged honest nodes have an inability to act either through, you know, just being afraid or, you know, whatever else, then, then I think this is an obvious, and I don't say consequence as a negative necessarily, but I think this is the obvious uh, you know, some of that math is that, okay, somebody who is more powerful will then make those sorts of unilateral decisions for the sake of keep it, keeping the border safe for, for lack of a better analogy. So I, I just wanted to put that out there as a bit of a thought experiment and see what you guys think of that, uh, as an, well, I'll kind of push back. I mean, honestly, I, the framing of all this is, is probably like, this isn't some new, we are the dictators and, and we needed to come in and save Bitcoin <laughs> sure. because governance isn't working or anything like that at all. Uh, in fact, I agree with you um, for the most part, everything you said. I think the the issue we, we've come up with is that if if the global SHA-256 hash power only had one choice to where their point, their hash power at, I think we'd probably be fine, yeah. actually, because um, they would be incentivized to make the correct decisions, which are include as many transactions as possible to get transaction fees. And yeah. the, the problem I think that we have right now is that um, th there's no holding the feet to the fire. If you, if you own all these ASIC machines, you don't actually have to do any meaningful work to grow the network. You can just point them at BTC, then at the right time you can point them at BCH, then you can point them at BSV, right. then I think you can point them at eCash. I don't know if they changed their algorithm, but um, yeah. whatever else, right? So, so I think sure. uh, it, it's enabled kind of just a lazy I'm getting rewarded for doing nothing type uh, uh, incentive <laughs> sure. mechanism. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, honest nodes hardly exist and there's a lot of lazy nodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, which, which again, 
couldn't have been foreseen. I think ironically, the system would have been so elegant if there was just one chain, but instead we've well, right. Exchanges well, yeah, have kind of well, provided and, and, this avenue and I, for I guess that's things. what I'm intending to express is essentially, you know, the 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 beautiful world that Bitcoin could build through perfectly balanced incentives has frankly failed. And and I will say that my prediction is that it would succeed for all of the reasons that it is elegant and, and all of those things. And frankly, I was wrong. 15 years on, we've seen that Bitcoin's base incentives did not lead to proliferation of Bitcoin. It has led to civil war and bickering and a couple of, you know, big major backstabbings and coup d'etats. And, you know, now we're forced to make decisions from a place of Hey, you know, some somehow we got to end this war and get back to getting back on track. And uh, you know, so, sometimes the borders that we wish we we controlled are not the borders that we have. So, I'll also <laughs> philosophize a bit Bitcoin wise, which is that yeah. The other reality is, you know, th the myth of like decentralized governance of Bitcoin was never the the intended state anyway. You know, Satoshi sure. didn't imagine that people could vote on whether the coin supply would would increase or not, right? Right. It was more, this is the terms of the network. And then there's a mechanism by which distributed nodes come to agreements on, on the state of the block, <clears> right? Yeah. But it, it, it didn't ever mean we would have decentralized governance by any means. Yeah. Um, so so I, I use the word distributed. It, it's a distributed yeah. system. It's not a decentralized system of governance. It's sure. there's a single system. Just, yeah. I just and, want and to clarify. You, you, yeah. I think that that's obvious but I am an extreme minority in that position. So I, I think the fact that we thought it was obvious is kind of why we have failed to uh, failed to resist the onslaught of people that are like, you know, your Peter Todd's who are like, well, of course we can just add tail and in, tail inflation forever. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So yeah, Mar what, Marson, sorry, what I wanted I to say off. is like, when, 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 you, when you think of uh, the most canonical uh, liberal thinkers, like Adam Smith, mm -hmm. John Locke, they had a very clear idea of what should be the role of the government, super limited, but still there was a role for the government, which was sure. law and order. So the society can, can, can cooperate. So in our case, it was a network, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was also clearly stated that whatever powers the government has, they should be limited and they should be limited by law. Uh, and I think this is exactly where we see the role of the association. We are we don't want to interfere with how the network works. We are not going to be one of the participants of the network. We are not going to run a node. We're going to uh, mess up with transactions uh, or change the uh, difficulty algorithm. No, we are just are going to enforce the rules that are super simple and that just allow the network to function properly. Well, and, and I think that's fair. And, and I should say that, you know, on my, you know, reading the tweet announcement, I'm, you know, I, I have to roll my eyes and say, okay, here, here's something else I have to read and adapt to. And hopefully I don't have to resist in a big way. But when, but when I actually read it, it's like, okay, well, it, like these are, these are very obvious things that we do not want to happen on the network. And so I think a lot of people's um, base resistance is like mine and saying that, you know, okay, when, when did I consent to this, essentially? And then, but when you actually read it, it's like, okay, th this is all reasonable. But I guess my next question then is, you know, from from where is this authority derived? Is that part of the written in stone? You know, I know Craig talks about the unilateral contract and Connor, you and I have had private conversations about, okay, how do we define, like Craig says it, but it's one of those other things, like what is the protocol, right? And so... Um, what are your thoughts and are your thoughts, uh, like have, are those codified somewhere? Like what, what basically, is there a way to predict next steps based on what is fact versus what is opinion going forward? Uh, can you clarify the last part? Uh, I get confused with the last sentence. So, um, yeah, let me let me think about the right way to rephrase it. <laughs> maybe maybe I, I'll, I'll answer the first part, which is okay. Please, um, it becomes a lot easier as an association instead of saying, instead of deriving authority from some esoteric arguments about 
unilateral contracts that are written down or anything like that. It becomes a lot easier basically to just make everything clear and transparent and put ink to paper, right? And, and, and I think that is much preferable than having a bunch of philosophical Bitcoin arguments on Twitter. Um, it's a lot easier basically just to say, look, um, we, we want to follow the original protocol. We want to, to build a network that is, is governed by the Bitcoin white paper. Here it is written down and uh, here's what we're going to do. And th that's a lot more preferable to me looking 10 years down the future. The vision that we are building towards is millions and millions and millions and millions of transactions per second, which is a system that cannot be governed by Twitter arguments about the phil philosophy of Bitcoin, right? It, it, yeah. So the the real need here is basically to just be transparent about what is happening, what the expectations of a node the network is. And, and those expectations are not coming out of nowhere. They are very clearly rooted in the original foundational principles of, of Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Maybe I answered your question. Maybe I didn't, I don't know. Yeah, Connor, <laughs> I mean, you're the brain here and I'm, the, I'm speaking the, the, the layman language. And yeah. I would say, Connor, if you, I mean, uh, Kurt, if you wanted to play football, um, something that you guys call soccer over there, you know, yeah. uh, just in the park and the, there'll be you and a couple of other folks and you say, okay, we have a ball, let's just, let's just play. Are you just spending hours discussing, okay, so what are the rules? Are we, you know, there's this ball, can we touch it with the hand? Do we have two goals? So like, you just, you just play. And the thing is that all of you as a participants of the game, you just agree that there is some sort of rules that regulate the rule of the game. In the same way, we can say with, with the what's the role of the association? We have a multilateral contract that exists as we speak, right? We have the nodes, there's this the association, and whoever joins this party, joins the game, is, is adhering to the rules of the, of the club. Somebody leaves, the rules don't change, you can come back if you play by the rules. And as a part of this rule setting is, is also the acceptance that there is this association whose rights and duties, but also obligations are clearly stated. They're also limited. They are subject to uh, legal scrutiny, um, judicial scrutiny if necessary. And we just agree that this is, this is kind of simpler for us to operate in this network that has this sort of, I wouldn't call it governing body, but an entity that can enforce the rules that we agree with. Same way as you would pick a, one of your colleagues would be a, or friends when you're playing uh, football, you would say, one of you is a referee. We just bestow on you the authority to, you know, stop the game when there is a fall or whatever. Sure. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, here's the thing. In, in practical terms, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people kind of don't know the history of the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, that I, I think had a little bit of this was was uh, starting to be established there, and then it it, it became uh, uh, basically di disappeared, or uh, Twitter decided that Bitcoin Foundation didn't have any authority, and so it just kind of went away. But um, I don't know. It's just a, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting next step that I know is controversial. I know a lot of people are very uncomfortable with it, so I'm trying to ask some sort of devil's advocate questions for the sake of gaining clarity. I'm not trying to be uh, argumentative, so I hope it doesn't come across that way, but. Um... Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I think I saw one of the questions in the in the chat. I unfortunately yeah. opened it and I saw all the comments, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, even if it wasn't there and I, I'm just imagining imaginary things, um, there might be a question, okay, so what if I as a miner I don't want to agree to these rules. I don't want to respect the association's role under the rules. Yeah. Well, then, well, then I could say, why don't you just mine elsewhere? Because there is a club of those miners, like currently it's Gorilla Pool, that's Mining Dutch, that's Tal, and I think there was also a fourth miner. Uh, I checked, we checked today in the morning. These four apparently agree to these rules. Yeah. And this is the rules of the game that they want to play. Nothing stops you as a miner, if you have a lot of hash, to mine elsewhere, to start over your own chain if you like. Why not? 
But here are the rules that we all that are being respected by the nodes of the network. And I think par the paradox is, I mean, Connor was saying that, well, that, that it's a problem that we don't have one chain, hence the hashes can migrate from different chains. But I, I would argue the opposite. Well, we have probably if you go on coin market cap, there will be like what? A couple hundreds layer one protocols, and there you have layer twos. There's so yeah. many things to choose from. You don't have to, you know, if if you don't like the rules on that that, that BSV, that well, we, we all think probably that is that adhering most closely to the original Bitcoin protocol uh, is 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 respecting. I mean, why why not to go elsewhere? Sure. Well, and I think that's fair. You know, no, nobody's forcing you to mine BSV, and therefore, um, but I think also, you know, what about um, you know the people that say, well, you know, Bitcoin was supposed to get away from third parties and third parties making decisions about, uh, you know, it's it's in the intro that part of the problem of of finance today is that you have this mitigation that then has to be built into the cost of doing business and that bitcoin uh because it's just about finality and and instant payments lowers that cost of doing business and that was a primary function in bitcoin from the white paper so what do you say to the people who, who would say well isn't this just adding a new third party or some kind of arbitration level that is going to then reinsert extra stuff to the cost of doing business i mean there, there had been different attempts to create digital cash before bitcoin mm -hmm. and uh, electronic cash and they all had this central authority that was there only to uh, prevent double spends there had to be someone just right. i mean not necessarily to root all the payments but just to make to provide a record so the coins are not the cash is not double spent bitcoin was eliminating this sort of trusted third party yeah. now to that argument that you you mentioned when you look at the role of the association under the network access rules i think it i don't find any similarities that we are hmm. this sort of a trusted third party you can join free the network you can mine there and even when we when you look at the the alert system which is the the messaging it's its intention yeah. is called it's it's a messaging mechanism. There is no mm -hmm. magic button that either I or corner we we have in, in our hands that we can just push and kick a miner out of the network. All we can do is we can send a message to the network and expecting that the honest nodes will take action. That's yeah. it. Well, if the honest nodes, all of the nodes, disregard this because they don't agree. Nothing will happen, would it? Right. I think there's no in, in that point of view, we were checking this also, you know, with with, with different legal experts under Swiss mm -hmm. law, under the UK law. That was it was it was pretty clear that we are not introducing a central party to the system that eventually, if that will be the case, that would have significant consequences. We will be creating a payment system which we would require payment system provider license or and all the different uh, legal legal consequences and compliance uh, sure. consequences. So another thought, and we're getting near to the end of the show, so uh, we'll have to make it a little bit of a brief thought. But you know, when I when I look at laws, and and this is kind of a criticism for people that say, ah, you know, we we need fewer laws, and you get the people that say, well, why would you be afraid of more laws unless you're a criminal, right? And so I, uh, but I take a little bit the opposite view and say, well, I mean, I've, I've been running an honest company for years. I, I would not have been impacted by these rules one way or another. So adding these rules, it's essentially something that I can 99.9% .9 just ignore because I don't intend to bend the rules for gray market reasons or anything like that. But I, I think one of the things that, um, you know, some people might take issue with is, for example, you know, what if we raise our, our minimum transaction fee to... I mean, frankly, whatever we want, because that's a little bit more of a business operations decision as opposed to something that is necessarily malicious. So I, I think that that can be uh, intrusive, especially because it's completely open to interpretation when something is actually degrading. And, and you even said like mining an empty block is something that's just emergent. Sometimes it happens just because of probabilities. But, you know, what if 
you know, as a company, you know, we have a board of directors, we have investors and things, and they're saying, hey, you know what? We're like, what if I get outvoted? My board of directors says, you know what? We're not mining something for one sat. Like we're going to have a hundred sat minimum for for what we mine at this company. And, and that becomes a company policy that makes it that our blocks only maybe have a dozen transactions in them for, you know, X amount of time. So like, what is that actual process? Like who, who's involved? Like, do we get a, a phone call from Connor to ask us to change or, you know, like what can, can we walk through what that would look like in that situation? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do that given the time constraint here. I, I don't know if yeah. talking about fee policy is, is the most, um, it, it's not really relevant here. And, and for two reasons, number one, I, I understand why you're asking the question the way you're asking it. Um, but and I, I'm not trying to avoid the question at all. I'm happy to do it in any other but, form. And I'm, and I'm not trying to catch you either. I, I just want to walk <laughs> through it. The, 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 the Sure. Um, <clears throat> number one, you are allowed to set your own fee policy to create blocks that are economically make sense to you, right? Mm. Um, that that makes sense. That, 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 that's a clear function of Bitcoin. In fact, the entire block size issue is an economic issue. Right. Um, the reason yeah. why you un you remove the the cap on a block size is so that miners can make emergent decisions on the optimal block size based on economic factors. Right. Um, yeah. One of which is the transaction fee. One of which is will this block be accepted by the majority of the network? Can they handle the amount of bandwidth I'm about to to send? Um, so these are all economic dis decisions. The the entire system isn't security by economic functions right and, and by no means will this change that at all um that's why I'm, I'm really not interested in this isn't relevant for the scenario you're talking about um with that said if you decide to start attacking the network um you, you would probably see a message sent through the alert system first right. uh, uh and then i do know how to call you so I maybe, maybe <laughs> I will call you, but um, for the most part yeah, I mean, we can talk about hypotheticals and, and what ifs, um, and I'm yeah. not trying to to pretend like some of these might not happen, but yeah, uh, for the most part, this this is for real serious scenarios, but by, by which we've seen before, and I'll, yeah. I'll reiterate the one that that's very obvious is two and a half years ago, a miner built 150 blocks in secret and double spent in exchange, and yeah. the association helped coordinate the honest nodes in the network to reject that chain. And, and and build honestly and and that to me is the prime example of what we're talking about by which the technical but by, by which the node software itself doesn't have the technical means to reject an attack like that mm -hmm. i mean <clears throat> yeah i have nothing to add to that uh <laughs> maybe yeah. one thing when you said so what's going to happen who should, should you expect a phone call from connor um and Yes, there is an alert mess system, which is a messaging system, which is a different type of alerts, informative. We can inform you, hey, you, there is a new release. You should update the, the, the nodes. There is a digital asset recovery, which you didn't touch upon today, uh, which is one of the type of alerts. And the third one is kind of the alert when you're requested to perform certain activity as uh, in response to an attack on the network, right? Mm -hmm. But the way these alerts are generated internally. So, so who's really pushing the button? Who's making this kind of digital uh, phone call to you by sending the alert? This whole process has been developed together with, we are not allowed to mention the name, but mm -hmm. with one of the most reputable global consulting companies um, with huge amount of experience in risk and compliance also in legacy businesses like financial sure. industry we are talking about you know jp morgan's of this world right sure um, they help us to develop a target operating model internal compliance system to make sure that this system is that th the chance that this system is ever misused because of operational reasons or some security reasons uh mm -hmm. this doesn't happen we are going eventually, I mean, it's still very fresh, but we are going to eventually publish 
all the documents that describe these internal processes. Cool. We are going to do it also to for you as mm -hmm. someone that has a vested interest to know how these yeah. things are happening, but also to those that are building on BSD blockchain. Right. After we publish, or maybe at the same time, we'll also have another reputable auditor, think about big four companies mm -hmm. that performs an audit of this. And not only about, you know, just performing uh, an audit and auditing a uh, set of rules and documents, but really uh, that the association, the whole governance model of the alert system will undergo in-depth in audit. And this report we are also going to publish. There's nothing that we are afraid of that we want to hide. Sure. We want to have full transparency regarding this. But it, give, give us a little bit of time, right? Sure. It's, we released the rules only two weeks ago. Yeah. No, and, and I can appreciate that. And we are a little over time, but if, if you guys are okay, I'd like to go a couple more minutes if that's all right. Yeah, I'll ask your wife. So <laughs> she, I can see them playing on camera, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay. So DAR came up, Digital Asset Recovery. So I personally, I actually think that the the amount of rigor that would need to go into doing a no private keys moving of coins and all this other stuff, I tend to think that it's near impossible for it to ever happen. That's just kind of my my gut feeling is that just coordinating what's necessary to make that happen seems like almost worse than you know trying to to just calculate a double spend <laughs> do, doing doing something uh that way it seems like it's probably more expensive and everything else so now i, I can see both of you guys calculating a response already based on my question <laughs> <laughs> but i'm, I'm curious exactly, but yeah. well be, be, because you know the criticism from everybody and this is our our internal and external critics of bsv and everything is that the purpose of bsv was for craig to steal satoshi's bitcoin now w what's your response to that I, I would love to take this one <laughs> i'd love to take this one um yeah yeah we are, we are facing we've been facing this for, for 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 very long and we are still facing this argument and before we had network access rules what was really stopping? I mean, I'm following the line of argumentation of, of those critics. What was really stopping the association or Tal as one of the main miner, or maybe Gorilla Pool, because you know you work for CoinGig, obviously you must be a paid shill, you know, right. etc. What right. is it's really stopping fake, yeah. you to get to, to so so so, co so Craig comes to you, gives you a phone call, or goes on Twitter and says, tomorrow, if tomorrow Tal, uh, Gorilla Pool, and all the other miners. Yeah. Don't reassign me my 1 million Satoshi coins or my 100,000 BSV coins from the pineapple hack. I'm going to sue sue the hell out of you, right? Yep. What was really stopping us? I mean, it didn't happen, but well, this argument was still could, could still be raised. Now, sure. with the network access rules, it's clearly stated that the digital asset recovery can happen only, so the, this alert and free, uh, freezing and recovery of the assets, so reassignment of the coins, can happen mm -hmm. only if there is a valid and enforceable court order that is valid and enforceable in the UK or Switzerland. Okay. So there will be no privileged treatment, even of Craig Wright, as long as he doesn't show up with a court order that is valid and enforceable in Switzerland or in the UK concerning some of the coins, there will be no digital asset recovery message sent to the network and requesting to reassign any of the coins. I think this is this is the most we could we could do, right? We're we're limiting ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, but from that reference, the there will be no preferential treatment to anybody. No, and, and maybe I, just one one last final remark. Yeah. In this whole setting the association will not really analyze. We, we are not judges. We are not in the place position of a court. If somebody shows up with a court order that is binding upon us, same way as if somebody shows up with a court order that is enforceable upon you, there's very little you can do. And of course, sure. you could appeal, etc. But yeah. you have to abide by the law. 
So yeah. we will not an analyze it from that respect. We'll see if the criteria are met. We'll verify if the court's order is really valid and enforceable, and we'll enforce it. We are enforcers. We are not judges. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Any any last thoughts? Anything you wish we covered while while we were in our talk here? I, I mean, I, I don't know, but I'll, I'll just say, look, uh, from the association side, there, there's basically a big desire to be transparent and clear and, and um, you know, to answer questions about this, right? So uh, there's no hiding from it or anything like that. Uh, uh, I think th the most important thing for me as someone who just loves Bitcoin is um, clarity is, is is needed, right? We want clarity not just internally, but we also want clarity externally. Um, and as we are testing millions of transactions per second, you want to envision how this system will actually function um, at millions of transactions per second, which means large conglomerate enterprises will be the ones actually mining. Uh, maybe yeah. Growpool will grow up to be one of those. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, we're, we're talking about the Amazons of the world. Right. right. Um, yeah. And, and so the Amazons of the world don't live in anarchy. Um, the system was never designed to be decentralized anarchy. It was Satoshi's project. He was very clearly a dictator in, in a lot of scenarios. Yeah. Um, and and uh, our goal is just to protect that project and grow that project, not to allow it to be changed by anybody, including ourselves. Cool. Final thoughts, yeah. Carson? Well, one last thought, maybe that something that I would like to, that, that those who listen to us and watch us today, that it stays with them is that the rules are also limiting the association the same way as they are binding upon the nodes, they're also binding upon the association. So uh, mm. we have clear limitations, we have clear duties, not only rights. And I think that eventually should I mean, logically, should bring more trust also to the role of the association, which was yeah. before not properly and clearly defined. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, uh, it's been a pleasure. I, I know in, in some ways it was a little more of a difficult show than a fun show, but uh, I think I think it was a good show. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you guys have put a lot of work into this. I, I know because uh, I've personal relationships a little bit with both of you. And so we talk a bit about, uh, you know, what's, what's going on in Bitcoin. And, and I know this has been something that uh, you guys have uh, not done frivolously or, or, or anything like that. I, I know that this was uh, done with a lot of thought and a lot of care. So um, I also know it's going to remain controversial, just like uh, everything else in Bitcoin. <laughs> so, um, so I appreciate you coming on and, and having a frank discussion and, and answering questions. Uh, while I didn't put anybody's questions up on screen, I, I was trying to inform some of my questioning based on what I was reading. So, so as not to, uh, you know, just muddy, muddy the water, pretend like, uh, you know, everything's fine and everyone's happy, which is probably never going to be the case. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you again. Uh, looking forward to seeing you both soon. Will I see you both in London in May, I presume? It's the plan. Yep. yep. Cool. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks well, for having we'll... us. For sure. So, all right, everybody. Um, you know, I, again, like the, talking about law and governance and scenarios where we we may or may not be under attack, and all this is not uh, not the funnest conversation to have uh, <laughs> about Bitcoin, but but I think it's an important one because I think it's something that Bitcoin has gotten tragically wrong for about fifteen years straight with. Uh, frankly, everybody thinking that their version of you know, utopian, either libertarian or authoritarianism over Bitcoin is going to be the thing that's definitely going to work. And I think everybody looks at everything through their own biased lens as to what is perfect about Bitcoin. And, and I think that's why people get so passionate about it one way or another, that oh no, you know, my my presumptions about Bitcoin's beauty are being undermined by this other person or these people are gaining too much authority or now, you know, we, we've seen this now forever. It's, it's literally 
dev groups and venture capitalists, and then it's, uh, you know, groups of nodes. And now Bitmain has too much power and just all, all these other things in Bitcoin. And I think, I, I, I think that, you know, again, like, like I said, in the middle of the show, I, I was wrong about what Bitcoin's incentives would lead to. I, I would have figured if you would have asked me in 2013, 14, 15, what Bitcoin would look like in 2024, we would not be here. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, with a little bit of humility, I, you know, I, I have to admit that, you know what, I, if I was right, then, then a lot of these conversations wouldn't be necessary, but frankly, it, it is necessary to, to more properly define, um, you know, starting from where we're at. And, you know, I, I make the civil war analogy a lot because I've been writing about the Bitcoin civil war now for six or seven years that uh, we we have experienced essentially a border dispute over what's the real Bitcoin and who's in charge and is everybody in charge? Is nobody in charge? Is it emergent capitalism, economic incentives, you know, whatever else. And so um, this conversation will rage on, I'm sure. And uh, of course, I appreciate you watching everybody. Um, we will not solve this today, uh, but we will continue to work on it. And the way I see it is the incentives lead me to want to cooperate with my fellow Bitcoiners, even if uh, there's a little bit of tension on the details. So everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, your likes, subscriptions, and uh, you know, signing up for alerts and stuff, really, um, they really do boost the channel. And I appreciate you spending the hour and 12 minutes with me today uh, on the show. Um, most days there's nothing I would rather do, but today I'm looking forward to uh, putting my feet up and maybe having a piece of cake and chilling out with the family. So Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again to uh, Connor and Marcin for, for coming in from BSVA um, and everything else. So final thought, be good to each other. If we were just good to each other, we wouldn't have to have these conversations about how do we deal with being bad to each other. <laughs> so, uh, you know, hopefully hopefully we can be better. So everybody, thanks again. I'm Kurt Walker Jr. This has been the Coin Geek Weekly live stream. See you next week. BSV is more than another chaotic commodity craze. BSV blockchain can do more than just be a crypto investment. It can help you get more out of your games, share more of your art. BSV makes more things possible.